uh, we're going to talk about uh, laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. You might think, what is there new to say about that? But I must admit that uh, even now, after having done so many years of practice, I'm still learning uh, each time again. And uh, there was a quite recent uh, publication that set out this uh, new 10 golden rules and anatomical uh, pictures of the groin that really uh, is, I think, very important for people to try to follow and, and, and to get a grasp on it to do a good and durable laparoscopic hernia repair. It's a great pleasure to be uh, doing this together with uh, David Chen from LA, whom you all know, obviously, and he will kick off with the first presentation. Uh, we will ask you a few questions to check, uh, and that will be on the web search probably, to check if, uh, if uh, what are people that are listening now are doing at the moment. So maybe can we put up the first question, Hugo? So first question, we just want to see what our audience to today, to, to this evening or this day, whatever you live, uh, looks like. Uh, so what's your current preferred technique for a groin hernia? Let's say you have a, uh, uh, a basic primary non-complicated groin hernia. What's your favorite technique? Do an open repair, a laparoscopic repair, a tap repair, or a robotic? Uh, I've put tap repair there. Uh, okay. So let everybody choose. So we see the majority is uh, laparoscopic, uh, some open surgeries, uh, surgeons, uh, about 30%, and only very few robotic surgeons are online here. Uh, okay, good to know. Next question, we had a second question, which is more about uh, which mesh and which fixation do you use if you do laparoscopic repair? Obviously, if you don't do laparoscopic groin repair, you, you, can, you have to answer the last uh, uh, line. So it's a flat mesh without fixation, an anatomical mesh or a 3D shape or a shaped mesh without fixation, a uh, mesh fixed with tackers, fixed with glue, or a self-fixating mesh uh, type pro-grip, or another mesh. Uh, submit your answers. Okay, so still a lot of people uh, using tackers uh, and we see a combination of the other second is pro grip, 15% pro grip. Uh, okay, thank you for answering that. I think David will give first uh, a presentation then we will have uh, two short questions, polling questions. And uh, after that, I will uh, show basically a surgical video uh, running through these 10 golden rules. Uh, David, of course, are yours. Great. Let me just make sure I'm unmuted. Perfect. So, all right. As usual, I'll have a lot of slides. So we'll go through this uh, quickly. And the nice thing is that you have these slides in perpetuity on IHC. Uh, and it will also be housed on web search. So we're going to be talking about the 10 golden rules to MIS inguinal hernia repair. And this is really a great collaboration between IHC and Medtronic. We've We've really seen that uh, we've been able to reach a lot of our friends and our hernia community online. And we see that, uh, that even though we're, we're socially distanced, we're definitely not isolated. You can see all of our, a lot of our IHC friends here. Uh, Brian uh, had started these webinars. We had one with Dr. Demeester before on parasophageals. And you can see here in the bottom left corner that uh, the EHS had an amazing uh, Congress, even though Barcelona couldn't happen. It was really a fantastic Congress and the content was just really excellent. But it's such a nice way that we can all connect with each other. Uh, and this day today really is a, the brainchild of uh, Brian and Ruth up there in the corner. Sorry, Ruth, that's not your greatest picture, but it was our screen capture. Uh, but uh, Philip and I are really excited to participate in, uh, in this collaboration. Um, 
So groin hernias, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, one of the most common operations worldwide. And uh, we, we see about 20 million worldwide. And the number that we use is somewhere around 800,000. You know, obviously this goes up and down, but somewhere in that ballpark, what we know is it's one of our highest volume of surgeries as general surgeons. And what we do know also is that recurrence overall, we've done a lot better uh, with recurrence being a, somewhere around 2%. Uh, but pain really becomes uh, an important um, quality outcome. Six to eight percent of folks can have some degree of significant pain. And so when we talk about hernia repair, we really would say it's not just that they didn't get a recurrence, uh, but it's really that quality of life becomes the most important outcome in groin hernia repair. Obviously, in the developing world, we, we can argue that because it's a different disease process uh, and implication. But for the majority of our bread and butter in inguinal hernia repair, we really want to do a good job because it affects our patients' lives. When we talk about inguinal hernia repairs, you know, there has always been a debate between open or TEP or TAP or robotic or laparoscopic. But the modern hernia surgeon, I like this, this description, that the modern hernia surgeon is not bound by any one technique that we may decide that we love TEP or TAP or robot best uh, or an open or a shoulder ice. But if you really wanna be good at hernia surgery for inguinal, you need to be able to be in this overlap and say, I'll do the right thing for the right patient. Hernia surge, um, you know, obviously we're preaching to the choir a little bit here with a group of hernia uh, interested folks, but is a, is a great project between all of the world societies. And we sought to have international guidelines for how to manage groin hernias. And what we know from that, the guidelines as of, two, as of two and a half years ago, this is the best available data, that mesh repair still is definitely recommended, both open and laparoscopic, because the outcomes are better. No one standard repair technique exists. That, there, that the, the greatest thing, all these studies, when you compare data for inguinal hernia, is that it doesn't correct for the one most important thing, who the surgeon is and what their training is. And so... What we do know is that if you go to someone who understands inguinal anatomy and does a good job with their technique, you're going to have a good outcome. As hernia surgeons, uh, as folks that are interested in this, we should want to each provide an anterior and posterior option for repair. Lichtenstein and LAP being MIS and also now that would include robotic because it's functioning the same operation. These are the best evaluated. And this is the in yellow, the important thing from hernia surgery. It was the first time in guidelines that we said provided available resources and expertise, MIS techniques are recommended. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, tissue repair, shoulder ice, can also be offered in the right patients with the right surgeon, you can have great outcomes. So, but what are the benefits of MIS inguinal hernia repair? So we, we know that there's a faster return to work and normal activities. Obviously, this is skewed by what your recommendations to patients are. And statistically, it's not a huge difference, but it, it, definitely is a, uh, it definitely is a difference statistically. It's advantageous for bilateral hernias. You can repair all types of groin hernias, including obturators, and especially for the missed femorals. Uh, lower rates of chronic groin pain and sensory disturbance, but this also is a caveat of who's doing the operation and what their technique is, which is why today's lecture will be so important. And it is the optimal approach for a recurrence after an anterior repair. Here you can see if you had a bilateral, this is the left side and this is the right side, you can overlap the mesh, but you get a freebie because you see both sides. And here, this is an example, uh, this is a patient that I did this week that uh, this has uh, a recurrence after an anterior repair. And you can see this is the most common mechanism, a medial recurrence. Here's the anterior mesh right here. And so you just don't have the adequate coverage medially if your mesh is undersized, that you see that a Lichtenstein repair needs to have a wider medial overlap because it needs to get to the conjoint tendon here. But this is here where you can see that a laparoscopic repair is a virgin plane after an open anterior approach. So what are the challenges of MIS adoption? So clearly there's a steep learning curve. Uh, inadequate dissection is a problem. Uh, incomplete view of the myopectinal orifice, will be, which will be the main topic of today. Folding or migration of the mesh over dissecting the triangle of pain, putting the mesh in the wrong plane, which we'll talk about. You want it in the visceral compartment, not the parietal compartment. Defect closure can cause uh, nerve uh, entrapment as well as entrapment neuropathy from fixation. And this applies as uh, Ed Felix's 10th commandment from the 10 commandments is, it applies to however you do this MIS, TEP, TAP, ETEP, RTAP, RTAP, whatever it is, it applies to all of those techniques. So why is it difficult? This is a quote from uh, Dr. Uh, Lytle in 1945, the operating surgeon knows little of the posterior wall of the inguinal canal so well is it hidden from his view. And this was definitely true in the early adoption of MIS. 
uh, you can see though that there are two people that I really attribute to, they, they didn't invent their repair, but they really worked hard to teach the anatomy and teach this operation systematically. And that's Professor Ed Felix and Pro Pro Professor Reinhard Bittner in Germany. If you look at the, the illustrations of anatomy in 1920, this was difficult anatomy to perceive because you were looking basically from a midline incision down into a hole. And you can see that this is the myopectineal orifice or their understanding of it. And from that though, we have where we understand uh, these very distinct landmarks, the triangle of doom, the triangle of pain. And you can see that the neurovascular triangle out laterally has our nerves and we'll talk about that. But we also have to understand any inguinal hernia repair, you have to understand the neuroanatomy because the anterior nerves play into the, into the game when you do an anterior repair. But in laparoscopic or robotic, if you sew or you tack, you can affect these nerves. And I always like to show this one on the right side that this is, uh, this is a nerve with nine branches. And so if you think that you're just gonna miss the nerves because you, you, know, you, you, didn't, you didn't put it in that place, it's really hard to not get unlucky. Uh, so they always need to recognize the posterior nerves. This is Wolfgang Reinpold's study, and it just shows you that although it's, uh, these nerves come out at L1 very reliably, they exit all over God's creation down in the myopectineal orifice. And so it's a very important when you look for these nerves. This is a single genitive femoral trunk on the psoas. Uh, this is lateral femoral cutaneous, lateral to the psoas. There are certain landmarks that are always there that you always exit LFC lateral and femoral lateral, but otherwise in the canal, there's a lot of variation. So in 2016, uh, Professor Diaz, our great friend and uh, Professor Felix published in Annals, uh, this critical view of the myopectinal orifice. And what, uh, what the point was, was they wanted a systematic approach to MIS repair. It was nine steps. They added a 10th one to call it the 10 commandments, decrease recurrence, prevent complications, facilitate a way to teach and evaluate other surgeons and improve patient outcomes. And this is one of the things that I really love is from IHC, International Hernia Collaboration really propagated this whole concept where we can we can push this message uh, from Ed Felix and Jorge that this was from 2016 uh, at uh, the first robotic uh, congress in New York that Brian put on. This is uh, things I learned, Ed Felix, 10 commandments for lap and robot inguinal hernia repair. And you can see that this published uh, soon thereafter in Annals of Surgery. And here's Jorge and Ed, and they really have this nine, nine, uh, nine points on what to do to standardize the repair. Here you can see Conrad, uh, the, promoting this in March. And this is really, he's been saying this the whole time. I love this, to learn it, live it, love it. And this is a really a tribute to, uh, to Jorge and to Ed. And so if we take the myopectineal orifice like that, we should always be able to think about it like this. And in, uh, in, as a, I like to say, it's like a clock face, the direct, the indirect, the femoral space. And then you have a landing zone for your mesh that you've dissected everything in that view before you land the mesh. And so we talked about it like this. Now, what, these are the 10 commandments, and you know you made it big, not when you publish in annals, but when you get in general surgery news. And so you can see Ed Felix's 10 commandments of MIS hernia repair. This is Conrad's uh, nice illustration of Ed as Moses and bringing down the 10 commandments to us to help us do better. And so this is a painting from Hans Holbein the Younger. This is the allegory of the Old and the New Testament. So I think of annals of surgery like the Old Testament. So the critical view of the myopectineal orifice. One of the gifts that we got from coronavirus is that right around February, Flavio, uh, Flavio sent this out on IHC that uh, he, pu he uh, posted that this was being published, 10 Golden Rules for Safe MIS Inguinal Hernia Repair, a new anatomic concept. And it was, Cristiano Claus was the primary author uh, that led the project. Uh, and here you can see it published March 26, right in the middle of COVID. And he talked about this new concept of 10 golden rules. And so 10 golden rules was published in surgical endoscopy. I, I consider this the New Testament version of the same rules. And so here what we can see is this is the group that came up with this uh, new concept of 10 golden rules. It is uh, our good friends, uh, Todi, Marcelo, Flavio, all guys you know. And then uh, you, you can see Cristiano here, the president of the Brazilian society. And of course, uh, the, the senior author, Ed Felix here, the, the expert on wine. And you can see that these guys really know how to have a good time when all of their uh, congresses are hernia and wine. So in wine, there is wisdom, in beer, there's freedom, and in water, there's bacteria. So it started from this article that Marcelo um, uh, published. And this was a systemization of lap inguinal hernia repair based upon a new tri uh, concept of five triangles in the inverted Y. So this is the five triangles. Instead of the clock face, they just split this into five distinct triangles. So the inferior epigastric, once again, uh, does the, the 
cephalocaudal bisection, and the iliopubic tract down the middle. So direct space, femoral space, triangle of doom, the indirect space, triangle of pain. You, this is the peritoneal view uh, by the plique and the ligaments, and this is the intra-abdominal, uh, the, the extra peritoneal view, as you can see here. And they describe this concept as an inverted Y. And so it's just a way that you can see this view each time, and you can go systematically through it. They also talk about the zones to go through, and this was published in Surgical Endoscopy this year, uh, 10 Golden Rules for Safe MIS Inguinal Hernia Repair Using This Concept. So they talk about the zones. So they talk about the lateral compartment is zone one, the medial compartment is zone two, and zone three being the hardest because all, uh, everything good, everything that causes trouble is in zone three. So they say that the zone three is what you will tackle last, okay? So golden rule number one, beginning the surgery. So in a tap, you start the flap four centimeters above the deep ring and you go from ASS to the medial umbilical ligament or, or reverse. You just have to understand the anatomy in each segment. And, and, and uh, in TEP, it's, you can either do blunt dissection or balloon dissection. So here, this is pictures taken from another great reference I'll show you, but this is from Reinhard Bittner's book. Uh, this is, you can see the internal view. This is the iliopubic tract. And this is where a flap is really going to um, proceed from. Dr. Bittner likes to start from lateral and go to medial. Uh, we know that with robotics, some people like to start medial because it's more fatty and then work their way out lateral. But really, it's just understanding what you're going to get in each compartment. And you can see hernias in each of these spaces from the intra-abdominal view. This is uh, Professor Bittner's book, Laparoendoscopic Hernia Surgery, and we wrote this chapter uh, with these great pictures, Clinical Anatomy of the Groin, that I'll, I'll show you a lot of these pictures in this presentation. So you need to understand the transversalis fascia in this preperitoneal space. When you open the peritoneum, you can see that there's peritoneum and then the glistening, the areolar transversalis fascia. If we do this uh, with a balloon, you can see when you open up the balloon, I always have the residents pump up uh, five pumps and you have to see the inferior epigastric up. If you see it below you, you're in the wrong space and don't, uh, don't keep inflating or it will bleed. I like to show this anatomy here just to, the inferior epigastric always has a upper feeder to the rectus and a lower feeder and oftentimes another one right at the bottom and I, I, we need to know this so often because I do so many revisional mesh repairs and things like uh, mesh removals that you have to understand where these branches come off. But it also shows you that if your balloon is in the on the other side of the inferior epigastric, the reason why you bleed is you avulse all these vessels. So golden rule number two, dissection should follow the preperitoneal plane. So keep the fatty tissue with the muscle because you want to cover the nerves and avoid exposing the muscle to, prever to preserve the nerves in zone one and you want to keep the epigastric vessels up as well. Don't over dissect the nerves and leave zone three for last. So here you can see this picture there where the inferior epigastric is covered by transversalis fascia the lateral compartment is covered by fat, and the peritoneum here in the yellow is dropped down. So the dissection plane needs to be against the peritoneum, not out here against the muscle. So in that zone one lateral dissection, you ideally want to be pre-peritoneal in that space of Bogros. It's thinner layer. Uh, you can have a potential for peritoneal holes. Uh, so the pitfall is that if you're in the pre-transversalis space, you can risk nerve injury. It can be more bloody. And then your mesh is in direct contact with nerves. Here's a picture from uh, Professor Bittner's chapter, and you can see here's the transversus abdominis muscle, then you have transversalis fascia, and you have both a deep and a superficial layer. So there's two compartments. There's actually a, what I call the parietal compartment and then the visceral compartment, and I'll show you where that's more relevant. On the medial compartment, you can see that in zone two, you actually have a superficial transversalis fascia here and a deep transversalis, transversalis fascia here. So the superficial, you can see, can be torn, uh, can be dissected here on the medial compartment. But you can see that there's actually what's called the intermembranous septum in between. And so you need to be able to utilize these layers to your advantage. This is this concept of two compartments of the preperitoneal space, that you have a visceral and a parietal compartment. And where that's relevant, these are pictures from a neurectomy, where I put the, this is the balloon, pre uh, this is preperitoneal. And then this here is the same patient, but pre-transversalis. So you can see that the artery is naked and the nerves are naked. So if you put your mesh in this plane, then you can have these problems of ultrastructural changes of mesh against nerve. And here you can see in the original descriptions when they didn't understand that there were compartments. This was the original description of uh, lap uh, inguinal hernia repairs. And this came from Bob Fitzgibbons. And I've taken out many pieces of mesh from the original surgeries 30 years ago where they have this exact configuration of four tacks along Cooper's and tacked all the way across the iliopubic tract. So 
when we understand this now, you can, you can, you can clearly see that this is going to cause trouble, that the mesh was too small, that the nerves are going to be taxed, and also that uh, you, you run into trouble printing any text underneath the iliopubic tract. But these are things that I see all the time. Neuropathy from over dissection, you can see the mesh folding, you can see here the mesh buckling, you can see here the nerve stuck to the mesh. And this is really because uh, this was in the wrong compartment or the dissection wasn't enough and it can lead to problems. So golden rule number three, medial extent of the dissection. So the pubis symphysis is your medial landmark and that's a minimum. You typically wanna cross over a little bit, especially in a direct hernia, at least two centimeters below the pubis, overlap the direct and femoral triangle. You wanna prevent lifting uh, from a distending bladder. You need to reduce direct hernias. You can placate the transversalis fascia for seromas, but don't close the defect. And then pre, uh, before you start the case, pre, uh, just have them empty their bladder. If they have BPH, you may need to put in a catheter. But this is the pictures that they, that um, in this you see zone two dissection should extend until you see the symphysis, the notch of the symphysis is your landmark. You should go one to two centimeters below uh, Cooper's, you can see here, this should be at least to this level. I like to get all the way into the obturator groove and it will expose your medial compartment for the direct hernias and your femoral compartment. So what do we do with large direct sacs? This is from hernia surge. So we see that the incidence of seromas can be reduced if you imbricate. Uh, seromas are common, but they tend to be a minor complication. But in big direct hernias, you can invert or fix to Cooper's ligament or imbricate. Uh, here's a video from uh, Eddie Parra, and it, he gave me this uh, from a scrotal hernia, and you can see him uh, actually, he gave me an example of actually sewing the direct defect shut. And if you're Eddie Parra, you can do just about anything because he's so good that, uh, and he gets lucky. So you can see, you can sew this, and it does make sense in these big scrotals because otherwise your mesh can get uh, thrown out. What I prefer to do on these is that I'll actually make a counter uh, open incision for the giant scrotals. But what the problem with that is, is that obviously this doesn't happen to Eddie, but this is a patient, and I've had a few of them, where that stitch came through and captures the iliohypogastric nerve right here. I've actually had where uh, ro some robotic repairs I've seen uh, where the whole cord is completely wrapped by a, a, a VLOX suture from below. And here you can see the nerve just being trapped by a stitch. So you just don't want to do that because the data just doesn't support it. Here's a video from Thomas uh, Swope, and he sent me this. Is just I thought this was a nice uh, example of just imbricating, where you're not grabbing beyond the plane of the floor, and you can then bring that down. And you can do this with a purse string. You can do this sewing to Cooper's. You can do this with an endo loop, but just don't pass the plane of the floor because otherwise the nerves live on the other side. Okay, so golden rule number four: your external iliac uh, vein should be visible. So you want to avoid missing a femoral hernia. And you need to then uh, know the difference between fat uh, from lymph nodes and fat from preperitoneal fat herniating. So here you can see, you need to see the external uh, iliac vein. Here we can see that this here is a node. This actually is Cloquet's node, lacun lacunar ligament. How do I know that? Well, because when preperitoneal fat herniates, just like with the cord lipoma from a retroperitoneal fat, it will have a broader base and come in, whereas nodal fat will be round like this. Here you can see a femoral hernia coming in and you can see it comes from a broader base and same thing exactly like we see with cord lipomas. When you have a hernia as opposed to a node, it is not, uh, it has a broader base instead of a round uh, nodal looking tissue obviously. And this is the view you should have. You should see uh, your iliac artery, your iliac vein, you can sometimes see a corona mortis, here's your obturator vessels and you need to have cleared lacunar and make sure that nothing's coming into this space. So a, a lobulated node can stay Cloquet's node can stay, but fat coming through there should be reduced down. Number five, extent to the cord parietalization. So we uh, have the inferior peritoneal dissection it needs to extend to where the vas crosses the external iliac vein medially, the iliopsoas muscle laterally should be seen, and the indirect sac uh, dissection is all, oftentimes the most challenging uh, to separate the sac from the cord. In the woman, uh, round the round ligament can be transected one centimeter proximal to the deep ring. I'll explain why uh, right after here. So here you can see this is the medial dissection. Vas should meet the vessel and the psoas should be seen laterally. Um, so the exploration of the cord, the sac is anterior medial, the lipoma is uh, anterior lateral, the vas is posterior medial and the cords are posterior lateral. So here's the round ligament. You can divide that one centimeter from, uh, from the deep ring because the genital nerve meets in the canal. So then you can, it makes it easier to lay down your mesh. Golden rule number six, your management of the sac. 
So in a large inguinal scrotal hernia, it's recommended to just transect the sac and abandon the distal sac in the scrotum. Uh, Pseudohydrocele is less uh, bad than traction and cord, uh, cord testicular injury, hematoma, or ischemic orchitis. So this sac here can be transected, and uh, that way you can minimize that. Golden rule number seven, explore the deep inguinal canal for a cord lipoma. So this is an extension of retroperitoneal fat. It's always gonna be lateral to the cord elements, can be a major cause of recurrence, Visualize iliopubic tract confirms, uh, here's the lipoma, you can see that, should reduce retroperitoneally. The iliopubic tract, when you see it, you know that you're, that you're done. And the data from hernia surge is that the lipomas should be removed in general. As opposed to inguinal adenopathy here that is lobulated, you can see that this is not a lipoma uh, because it is uh, this shape and configuration. So should we chase cord lipomas? Is this necessary or is this overkill? So it, it, this is a main cause of what would be a pseudo recurrence, uh, may cause more cord and testicular discomfort. We may be injuring the genital nerve. A retained lipoma is an infrequent complaint, and it's also not a true hernia. So we talked about this yesterday, actually. Igor said, are we causing more trauma to the gonadals? And Brian said, I think that it, when I reduce these lipomas, I tell people that it's just gonna hurt more in their testicles. And I said, this is really an IHC issue that we really made the cord lipoma uh, an, an issue. And this is really um, maybe a curse of us promoting this as an essential step. And so Brian yesterday said, shall we take a 180 and tell the world to go leave them alone? Go back to nine commandments. And really that's, uh, we'll have to talk to Ed Felix about that. Uh, but you know, there is an implication. This is a case I did yesterday. And this is a cord lipoma would pass through there. Here is the genital nerve coming through. And as I drive the camera all the way in, you can see here's the genital meeting, uh, meeting the, the cord there. Okay. So that is definitely where this, uh, when we are chasing these cord lipomas, we can cause both traumatic, uh, traumatic irritation to the cord and also to the genital nerve. And so that's something to consider. Are we doing too much? Uh, so at this point, when you've done this, you have, this is your stop point. You have, when you are done with this, the critical view of the myopectomial orifice. You have a complete view. And so from this new concept, you have five triangles or the inverted Y, or from our, uh, my old conception, it would be four quadrants. You have a parietalized peritoneum. All of the anatomic elements have been recognized and you should have hemostasis. And only then you have a landing zone ready for mesh repair. So here you have the five triangles, your direct, infraepigastric in between them. You see this very reliably, the upper crosser, the lower crosser, the feeder to the pubis. You have your infraepigastric, your triangle of doom, your femoral canal is cleared. This is the key. Your peritoneum is way down below all of this so that when you land your mesh, you have a nice landing zone for it to sit across these things where the peritoneum cannot lift from the bottom up, okay? So this is a nice picture from their article that shows what, the, what you wanna achieve. On the medial side, you wanna see the notch of the pubic synthesis. If you have a big direct, go even more. You wanna be at least two centimeters below the pubis. You want the vas to cross the external iliac vein. I tell the residents you need to see vas, vessel, vessel. I like to lift up this triangle of doom, the vas spermatic confluence, off of the vessels, and Ed will talk about that too, you wanna to make sure nothing's sneaking up below you. On the superior side, you wanna be four centimeters above the ring. That's where you make your flap on a tap. Laterally, you wanna see the anterior superior iliac crest, and lower side, you wanna see the psoas. Golden rule number eight, mesh size and choice. So a large mesh should be at least 10 by 15 centimeters, and it should that is adequate to cover the MPO completely. Once in a while, I'll cheat. If I have a really small petite woman, I'll obviously, uh, I'll cheat a little bit, but pretty much this is the standard size for every laparoscopic inguinal hernia or robotic inguinal hernia that I would use. I would only go bigger to so typically a, like a 12 by 16 or, or 12 by 17 if you have a big direct space. You need to cover the MPO completely. You need to overlap all spaces by at least three to four centimeters. You should reach the symphysis medially and the ASIS and psoas laterally. You need to extend one to two centimeters below the pubis between the pubic bone and the bladder. The edge of the peritoneum must be below the mesh, otherwise you'll lift up. And that's the ma main problem of clamshelling. And so here's a picture from their article about, you can see the, the coverage of where the mesh would wanna be. And this is why these preformed meshes are shaped like this because the anatomy is so reliable and this is what you want to cover. So covers the femoral canal, covers the direct space, covers the indirect space, and the peritoneum is well below this. So. Does the use of a larger mesh prevent recurrence after lapping inguinal hernia repair? This is data from hernia surge, so a small mesh is a risk factor for, for a recurrence, level 2A. Level 5, insufficient dissection makes it difficult to place a large mesh. 
And this is a key thing, even though it's level five. Fixation does not compensate for inadequate mesh size. So the recommendations are grade A, a mesh of at least 10 by 15 and 12 by 17 or greater for large hernias, direct, uh, greater than, so uh, basically a EHS M3 classification direct or uh, indirect uh, L3. So mesh choice, polyester, polypropylene, PDVF. Um, I think that, you know, that's real, a lot of surgeon preference and people will figure out, you know, what, what do they see as their personal outcomes, but all three of those materials, source materials are really, they, they do just fine for patients. Slit or no slit? I highlighted no slit because I'll tell you my preference in, and what we try to teach is no slit. Uh, anatomic or flat, that's a preference, self-gripping or glue, um, memory in the mesh, uh, and then uh, a lot of that is surgeon preference. In the beginning, uh, slit mesh was very popular, and you can see it was, the mesh was split, translating from a Liechtenstein repair, and also uh, penetrating fixation was used. This is the data for slit mesh. Cutting a slit in the mesh allows the structures to pass. It does not compromise testicular perfusion and volume per, per the evidence. Uh, there is no significant difference uh, in recurrence or complications, but the incidence of chronic pain and neuralgia is higher. I will tell you that the incidence of testicular pain is higher. Uh, very common because as the mesh contracts, it really constricts the, the cord. So, and that's data that we'll never get from level one data, but we, but we will get it from when I've taken out a thousand of these things, we can see that yes, this is a problem. In most cases, cutting a slit is not, uh, is not recommended, should be avoided just because you don't need to do it. Here's an example of a slit mesh. You can see the cord passing through the, through the mesh funiculus. And you can see that the, the mesh as it contracts just really constricts the cord. And it makes it really uh, not so pleasant when we have to remove those laparoscopically. Uh, robotics can definitely help with that. Um, and the slit mesh, this is, thankfully, this is a patient that had bilateral infected ones. You can see the slit, it's easy to pull out when there's pus. Uh, but you can see this guy developed uh, hydrocele because of the slit mesh technique. Uh, and that was just reactive hydrocele. When we remove the mesh, they went away. So golden rule number nine, mesh fixation. It's not necessary in most MIS cases. And I would really uh, push that. The, the article here this, uh, does, they recommended in large direct M3 hernias, and there's great data for that. Uh, but when they talk about TAC recommendations, they say, if you do decide to TAC, you immediately, you want to avoid the pubic bone. So you TAC into Coopers. Laterally, you need to be above the iliopubic tract, at least two centimeters. You want to avoid the infrapagastrics, obviously. Uh, and five to six TACs maximum is what they advocate. I would say that you only get one freebie and the one freebies at Cooper's, everything else is good luck to you. And I'll show you why. You, uh, they recommend external palpation with tack firing. So especially in a thin patient, if you fire that tacker, it can penetrate right through the wall. Consider glue or self-gripping mesh. Um, and fixation cannot fix inadequate dissection. We'll show that again and again. So if you don't fixate and you do a great MIS repair, genital femoral and LFC are your only two nerves that we really are concerned about sensory-wise. I have seen uh, femoral nerve injuries as well, which is really bad, but, uh, but really that's what you need to think about routinely. If you fixate though, you need to think about your iliohypogastric and your ilioinguinal because you can penetrate through the canal. This is a picture from the, from the article here. You can see Cooper's, that's a freebie. Rectus is probably a freebie. Um, you know, the nerves, uh, it's very strange to have an aberrant nerve that comes this medially, but the iliohypogastric subcutaneous portion can come this way. These are above the iliopubic tract. They talked about at least being two centimeters above. And here they have uh, three and four tack here. But the problem is you don't know where the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastrics are here. So these are not freebies. Um, and you can see this. This is the original conceptions. And we've seen many pictures of tacks. But when I see this picture here, I always like to show this as an example of, I like to think of this as this, that you're playing battleship and you have no idea what's on the other side. And I've seen many times where the patient has been on the receiving end of the loss there. So here's a tack going right into the nerve. Here's right through the mesh hitting the nerve. And here's, as we showed, if you sew, that's the nerve getting uh, sewn in by the robot. And so these are things that you just say, you don't know what's on the other side when we think about that. This is a mesh I took out just on Monday. And you can see here, this had about 20 tacks. So folded, uh, they didn't have an adequate dissection and they did put a lot of tacks to try to compensate. So tacks cannot fix inadequate dissection. Finally, golden rule number 10, deflate under direct visualization. I really like this rule because it really helps you. You do such a good dissection in many cases. And if the mesh then folds, you, you know, unfortunately that causes big trouble. Uh, so you prevents the peritoneum from folding or rolling the mesh. It prevents meshoma and clamshelling. 
If the mesh lifts, you need a wider dissection. Uh, suture instead of tacking the peritoneal flaps. I see people doing these great dissections and at the end they pull out a tacker and tack the flap down and it, you know, it, it really in the age of a uh, V-lock suture, uh, just drown the V-lock or, you know, it's such a good skill for people to learn. If you want to be a better laparoscopic surgeon or robotic surgeon, if you learn to sew that peritoneal flap, there's no other task that's zero risk otherwise than suturing the peritoneal flap. Just invest in learning to do that. And closure of the gaps is recommended. Here you can see the bilateral repair, and you can see I did this case yesterday, I'm deflating here. And then what I always like to do with a TEP is I drop the camera in a little five millimeter port, intra-abdominal, and I can see that this mesh is nice and flat. This is this giant scrotal sac sitting behind this, and you can make sure that the mesh is seated. And if it's not, you can flatten it out at that time and watch the deflation. With a TAPP, you can stick a suction in this plane and suck out the air too to, to replicate this kind of sandwich technique that we get in a TEP. Uh, but this is what happens if you don't. This is a clamshell. Here's another clamshell. You can see this is a patient actually that had a femoral nerve injury, a clamshell, but they also had a tack right in the femoral nerve. And this is a piece of mesh. You can see that it just is comes out and every patient scars differently with different meshes. And so it can be a normal weight mesh or a lighter weight mesh, but some people have robust scar and this, you can see this creates a lot of three dimensionality. So peritoneal flap closure, you can just make that a task that you just master. It really is uh, easy enough to do it. And it just saves both the cost and the risk of, uh, of attack. Okay, let's go to here. What about peritoneal closure? So the data for it, level three, uh, that uh, if you don't close it, this is a nice video of a loop of valve stuck in here, but the codec didn't want to play, but you can see that a gap can give you an SBO, pretty rare. One of the most important things is Jorge will show you that he doesn't even close the flap sometimes. It's all about managing the pockets of air. So if you have air uh, and a defect there, but you deflate all the air out of the intra-abdominal cavity and there's no air extra peritoneally, there's no impetus for the bowel to chase into there. But it's a, that's a higher level skill that you really have to then manipulate the air pressure to hold the flap up. So here in general, we recommend just close that peritoneum. Uh, you can see higher occurrence of bowel obstructions with TAP, very low risk, six in uh, 1,000 versus, but uh, statistically significant still, 0 0.5 versus 0 0.07 with the TAP. So you should close the flaps. Uh, so finally, chronic pain after MIS preperitoneal repair, we can minimize it by obtaining a critical view of this MPO. Avoid mesh in the parietal compartment of the preperitoneal space, limit your fixation, avoid the nerves below the iliopubic tract, avoid wrinkling of the mesh, uh, and use lightweight meshes. So if we need to understand this posterior anatomy, understand the preperitoneal space, the extent of dissection, and the mesh position are key to preventing the recurrence and always recognize your nerves. So here we see the old version of the 10 commandments and the new version of the 10 golden rules. They fundamentally are the same thing, but if this is your patient, I would counsel you that you should have this right on your screen up here. This is uh, the 10 commandments of MIS hernia surgery because when you give Ed Felix his picture of what his repair should look like, you better be able to justify what you did. So this is Parviz Amid, who was my mentor, and Dr. Lichtenstein. We always credit our mentors, including Dr. Felix, who is the senior author in all these papers, and Dr. Bittner, who really has uh, done such a service to us to standardize this repair. We will have some meeting for the America's Hernia Society uh, in September. I hope to see all of you guys there. Hopefully there will, uh, will I don't know where there will be, but it will at least be online. Uh, we look forward to when we can see each other again. And now my good friend, uh, Philip Moisems will be giving you the video demonstration of these 10 golden rules. Uh, Yuga, we have two questions during the transition. Can we uh, pop up those questions? So this question is uh, for bilateral laparoscopic groin hernia repair, I use, so two separate meshes, uh, one mesh covering both sides like uh, Philip's big wig technique, uh, other, or I do not do laparoscopic groin hernia repair. Well, Philip, you've converted 50 some people. So that's a, not, not really an easy task to do the one, one mesh, but uh, it definitely is effective. It's true stopa repair. Good, next question. For bilateral uh, laparoscopic groin, uh, so that's poll three. Can we get the next one? Yeah. Uh, so duplicate or invert the medial direct hernia defect? 
So I close the defect, I invert the hernia sac, I invert the hernia sac with a suture. I do not invert or plicate other or no lab. Okay. All right. So most people and the data would would say that you do not need to do it, but if you do, it can help you with seromas. Okay. So now Philip has uh, prepared a great video, beautiful one that we can see all of these steps. Um, I'm going to stop my share. And uh, Philip, you're going to share your screen. Yeah. Do you hear me? Do you hear me, David? Yeah. I hear you. I'm unmuted. So I will put this on uh, to show the whole screen. So basically what we're going to run through now is a surgical video. It uh, lasts about 20 minutes. And it basically takes you through the same steps as you, as David has been described, because they are based on the same great article, uh, but just to run through uh, the surgery. So well, you know I do robotic surgery, but basically it's the same steps as laparoscopy, uh, is the same as robotic assisted laparoscopy, all the steps are the same. So when we look at the groin, we have a very nice lateral hernia here. It's important to first uh, visualize the epigastric vessels, the vas deferens, and then the spermatic vessels. And this is this uh, inverted Y that is transected uh, from the iliopelvic tract. And so another important marker is the medial umbilical fort. Uh, make sure you don't mess it up, uh, mix it up with the uh, epigastrics. So we have the five triangles for uh, lateral hernias, for medial hernias, for the femoral hernias, the triangle of doom, and the triangle of pain. Uh, and as described in this article, which you have the anatomical description of these three zones, which is uh, zone one, which is the lateral one, which will entail uh, a lot of nerve structures, zone uh, two, which is the middle one, and zone three is the more complicated, the more hazardous one. Uh, so we start the operation. Rule one is actually to to incise the peritoneum on top of the uh, inguinal canal, about four centimeters above the internal inguinal ring, uh, to make sure that you come from on top. This is nice because first you can uh, orientate yourself using the epigastric vessels to give you a good orientation uh, of all the different structures. The surgery is uh, almost uncut, but it's about a speed of uh, two times uh, the normal speed. So rule two, rule two is actually follow that peritoneal plane and keep the fat and the fascia with the abdominal wall. This will uh, protect your uh, epigastric vessels uh, and also lateral will protect your nerves. So I do like to do my dissection first medial and all these different steps of the rules, we, we did most of them. Uh, uh, and it's good to see that these rules actually comply with what we were doing uh, since, since many, many years. So rule three, you have to extend your medial dissection. You wanna go about two centimeters below the edge of the pubic bone. You wanna visualize the uh, the synthesis, which usually you can see it's a, because it's a, a little uh, knot there. And uh, you want to cross the midline for one, one and a half, two centimeters. After having dissected zone one, I go to zone, uh, uh, zone two, I go to zone one. And it's only when you dissected zone one and two that you will uh, uh, give your attention to the cord structures uh, that are in zone three. So here, once again, you want to keep that shiny layer, that fascia, you want to keep that with the muscle because it will protect the nerves that are lying uh, under there. So you do not dissect the nerves like in, in open Liechtenstein repair and open uh, groin hernia repair. It's uh, advocated to really visualize and, and dissect the, the, the nerves. Uh, here, you just want to see, uh, you actually don't really want to see them. You, but uh, often you see them shining through that layer. So you see lateral one, should be inferior and guinal one. Then we're going to focus our attention on the uh, cord structures. Uh, 
as being said, I also like to go quite low below the pubic bone and I usually also dissect the, uh, the obturator canal. There's always a small fat pad in there. You can leave it in there or you can uh, reduce it. If you reduce it, it might bleed a little bit. This is the femoral canal with the gibbernut ligament. So now in this case, it's a lateral groin hernia. So now we're going to dissect the, uh, the hernia sac. Important to stay, once you've identified the peritoneum of the hernia sac, stay on the hernia sac. You want to dissect off the cord structures uh, slowly, gently, and making sure you're not going to injure that. Most of the times I do reduce completely the hernia sac. Uh, sometimes, and of, uh, this is most often in a young patient, uh, with a, a sac that goes deep into the inguinal canal, you're a bit afraid that it might be have a communication with the testicle, you don't want to really reduce those hernias. But if you're going to cut uh, the uh, hernia sac uh, and leave the distal part in the inguinal canal, you want to make sure that you've identified the spermatic uh, vessels and the cord structures uh, and the ductus deferens not to injure it. So here we're dissecting off the uh, hernia sac. As you see, once you've reached the top of the hernia sac, the sac will no longer be pulled into the inguinal canal. If you haven't reached the top yet, when you uh, let loose of the hernia sac, often it retracts into the inguinal canal. Uh, when it stops retracting in there, then, then you know you've reached the top. Rule four, uh, expose the uh, iliac vein. You want to make sure this is the corona mortis, as you know it. That's a, 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 con a connection between the... Uh, Epigastric and obturator vessels, and there you see the femoral canal. We see there's nothing going, no lipoma, no fat uh, tissue into the femoral canal, so we excluded the femoral hernia. Rule five, important step, parietalization. You want to make sure that uh, your mesh has a nice landing zone, like it's called. You want to have it on top of your cord structures and underneath the peritoneum. So when you're going to close the peritoneum at the end of, of the operation, or if you want to desufflate during a TEP approach, uh, you want to make sure that the mesh stays nicely on the bottom of the, the dissection plane. So that's the, the, the cord, the ductus deferens. And here you see that dissection. So lateral, you want to, you want to also dissect the uh, spermatic vessels and you want to expose the uh, psoas muscle. So you do that, and this is also, when you lift up that peritoneum, you'll usually see one band that is encircling the ductus deferens, and you really want to cut that as well. Otherwise, the, the, the ductus deferens will keep lifting up when you lift up the peritoneum like that. So rule six actually is basically what I said, that if you are feel obliged because the there seems to be no ending to this hernia sac and you want to cut it and leave the distal part, make sure that you've identified the other cord uh, the, all the cord structures. Good hemostasis, of course. So then rule six, and it has been discussed and as a, yeah, there's some discussion about it. This is, here, this lipoma is not very big quite easy to reduce but sometimes it's amazingly large when you when you you hardly see anything when you look uh, from this pre now dissection view you might sometimes see a very big lipoma coming out so this is the critical view of the myofectineal orifice uh, as it, sta it was stated you want to overlap your mesh three to four centimeters be beyond uh, any uh, hernia defect medial uh, lateral or femoral so this is the three uh, triangles. So in this patient, this is one of my first uh, uses of the, uh, the new Dextyle mesh. It's a 3D mesh, which is uh, made of, out of polypropylene. I rolled it up like I usually do with these uh, flat meshes when, I, when I'm not using ProGrip. Uh, I usually uh, tie them in a bundle like that. I just, when we sent the video to uh, some people commented that it's maybe better not to roll it up, uh, but you, just to put it inside the abdomen because you might change the memory 
of the 3D structures a little bit. It does go through an eight millimeter trocar, although apparently it's recommended to do it through a 10, but it does work through an eight as well. As you know, the XI robot uh, only has eight millimeter uh, trocars. Uh, so once we're in there, and, and I roll this mesh up uh, with, uh, with how we want to position it in the other, and it does, it does uh, take away a little bit of the 3D structure and the, and the memory that they created in this mesh. So your mesh should be, as David said, should be at least uh, 10 by 15. Uh, I think this mesh is 17 by 13, or, uh, and the program mesh is 12 by uh, 16. So there's a marker on there, it just uh, says midline, I suppose. Uh, so and obviously there's a right one and there's a left one, so you don't wanna, you don't wanna open up the wrong, uh, the wrong uh, mesh, of course. And then it, uh, you can leave it. In this case, I did put one suture on the, on the pupus there because probably because I rolled up the mesh, you keep, you see there's a little bit of memory there. Uh, so uh, this is my more usual way of, uh, that's my go-to mesh for most of the cases. This is a pro grip, a lab pro grip mesh, which is 16 by 12. And I fold it up like this. Uh, as you know, part, the upper part of this mesh has, it's an anatomical version, has a, uh, a barrier. To, to avoid that the mesh becomes too sticky into each other. So uh, here you see me positioning this mesh. I think certainly in the pro grip mesh, you wanna make sure that you, uh, thank you. Please stop sending me messages. How do I do that? Now everybody sees my emails. That wasn't the intention. Oh, maybe that's better. So rule 10, this is the, the lab pro grip mesh. Start sharing again. It's complicated life. So let's go back a little bit maybe. So this is a uh, unfolding of the mesh. For the, I think it's very important to, you do, to do your dissection well. Uh, certainly if you use ProGrip because you don't want to do additional dissection uh, when, once your mesh is in the preperitoneal position. So do a good wide dissection uh, that you can unfold it. Uh, because in the beginning, there is some learning curve to using ProGrip uh, in these confined spaces. But I do like the fact that ProGrip fixes uh, all over the uh, surface of the, uh, all over the surface of the mesh actually, uh, rather than at some fixed points like you have when you put tackers or blue. Uh, lifting up the peritoneal flap. So this is my second try for the dactyle mesh where I rolled it up in the different direction uh, that maybe next time when I use it, I will not roll it up, but just uh, put it in the abdomen so that uh, we retain the, 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 the memory and the shape that, that the uh, the developers of the mesh have uh, have made to to accommodate the uh, preperitoneal space. So once again, it does fit quite well through an eight. I think I I don't think I would uh, use a bigger mesh, uh, bigger trocar. Although it's uh, I'm sure they played on the safe side to recommend a ten. Of course, if you have a ten, use a ten. So this is another patient that has a medial groin hernia. I'm not going to show the whole dissection, obviously. Uh, this is what, one of the reasons that maybe uh, we should get a checklist also with the 10 uh, rules. Because here you see, I was a bit excited about using a new mesh and uh, really focused on that more than on, on, the, uh, on all the different steps. And you will see that actually when I run through 
the steps at the end of the operation, I realized that I forgot uh, step seven. So maybe it's an idea like we have the safe surgery checklist to have just a checklist at the end of the operation that I do uh, everything right. And certainly for the lipoma, it's easy to forget. Uh, and I think I'm almost at, and you see here that the, the mesh fits nicely, it has this 3D memory uh, structure. I do not think this mesh needs fixation, although it's a TAPP. I think it's more people that do TEP that, uh, that are happy not fixing mesh. But I think also for TAPP, you can, uh, you can, uh, here you see it. You don't see a lot of that lipoma there, but I realized, oh, I forgot that step. Uh, and actually when you see it, there is a lipoma. I did, and, and the discussion can go, should you remove it or not? But I did have some patients that we reoperated, and certainly females, it can happen that, that uh, they might have complaints that are very similar to what they had before the operation uh, and, and, and uh, have pain as well from this preperitoneal lipoma. Although when you, when you do an ultrasound or an MRI, you, you actually see there's no, no recurrence, but clinically it, uh, it, it really mimics a, a recurrence. So big discussion also always, do you remove that fat or not? Uh, I don't think you necessarily need to remove it. Of course, you really want to put it in front, uh, on top of this mesh. You want to avoid that it slides back under again. Uh, it depends. Sometimes I take it away, sometimes I don't. It depends a little bit uh, on, on the, the, the inspiration of the moment, I think. Uh, or the size. If it's a very big lipoma, I will take it out. This one, I decided just to, to leave it there. And now, once again, you want to lift up that peritoneum, you want to close it, and you want to really keep the uh, keep the mesh in place. So, uh, the very last part of my my talk. Uh, yeah, I'm looking. Yeah, I'm just, this is part of the video, just explaining if you use a V-lock suture like I'm using here, the barb suture, make sure that you don't leave uh, any, any, any barbs intraperitoneal. So what I do, I usually uh, lock the suture twice, uh, like you see me do here, and then I throw one more and I will cut this suture now flush to the peritoneum. So the part that sticks out, the last part of the, of the, the suture will be in front of the peritoneum. So what's not a lot discussed in that paper of the 10 rules, and I call this a, the rule XX, is, is the female groin. This is a patient where you, you saw she had a lipoma of the, of the cord on the right side. The left side was a little bit better to show the anatomy. So, but basically you have similar structures. You have the uh, epigastric vessels. You have the medial umbilical fold. Of course, you don't have a ductus deferens. We have the round ligament of the uterus. So. Uh, basically, you want to identify uh, the epigastric vessels as well because uh, they, will, they will guide you towards the anatomy. So we've done rule one, cut it high. Rule two, follow the peritoneum. Rule three, I'm not going to repeat everything. Although repetition is a good uh, way of learning things. Uh, dissect the pubic bone. As I said, I usually dissect medial first and then I go lateral. Uh, also here, and maybe even more important than in the, the males, check for that uh, iliac vein. You really want to see there is no, uh, no fat or no peritoneum going into the femoral canal, and you want to exclude that, uh, uh, that femoral uh, hernia that might be there. So as you know, there's no uh, spermatic vessels, there's no ductus deferens, but of course we have the round ligament of the uterus that is in there. And uh, there's always a big, uh, some discussion, should you cut it, should it not cut? I tend to, and for many years I've tried to preserve it, which uh, in the majority of cases leaves you with a small hole down there in the peritoneum because ultimately the, uh, the, uh, the round ligament will run intraperitoneal, so it's almost inevitable. So, but one day I put it on IHC, what to do, and actually all surgeons, except me and one other guy, I don't remember who it was, uh, were trying to preserve the round ligament. And ever since that, more or less poll, you could call it, or peer uh, discussion, I decided to cut it. Important, cut it not too close to the 
the inguinal opening because you don't want to injure any nerves there. Cut it, uh, leave, leave one or two centimeters, stay away one or two centimeters from the uh, inguinal ring. So once again, the critical view of the pyopectinian orifice, lateral hernias, medial hernias, femoral hernias, and uh, once again, use a mesh. I, I use standard, the, 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 the ProGrip mesh comes in two sizes, 15 by 10 and uh, 16 by 12. I standard use 16 by 12. We don't even have the, the smaller one in our hospital. So once again, uh, unfolding the mesh, covering uh, all the potential areas of, of uh, hernia, medial, lateral, and femoral. There is some tricks to it, of course, and, and, and it's basically also practice to unfold these meshes in the preperitoneal position. Uh, you see this is speeded up twice, so it doesn't take that long to unfold it. Uh, but of course, for your first cases, people might struggle uh, a little bit more. One of the things if you're going to do robotic surgery, it's very important to know uh, that these robotic instruments are very, very strong. So you have to take care if you handle mesh with robotic instruments, because if you take a mesh in between two grasping instruments, you pull the instruments apart, the mesh will break. And that's not because the mesh is too weak, that's just because the robot is too strong. Uh, so this is something to take care of when you're handling mesh, be it groin hernia or ventral hernia, uh, when, you, uh, when you do uh, robotic hernia surgery. So this is uh, suturing. I'm trying to do some ergonomics by using uh, the, uh, the scissors to suture. So uh, read this paper. Uh, I think it should be a, a benchmark and, and a go-to paper uh, for teaching uh, these different steps. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the video and I think it complemented the, uh, the brilliant talk of uh, David. There will be on the international collaboration and question, uh, answer and question session, which will probably, we're still looking at the best timing, probably on Friday, so stay tuned on IHC. Uh, to discuss with me and Frederick and Brian Jacobs will uh, will be the moderator uh, to to answer all the questions that you might have. You can already post them on the IHC if you want, so we can uh, upfront think about uh, some of the answers. So, David, are you still there? Yeah, great, great video, Philip. It's such a nice, such a nice thing to watch the whole operation right through. Um, so what we're going to do uh, right now is we're going to, there were a few questions that came in from the Q&A and also from the chat. Uh, and what we're going to do is uh, we're keeping, tra keeping track of all the questions that people have. We'll have a question and answer session Friday night. So um, Friday night U.S. time. So that'll be early Saturday morning uh, for Philip. So sorry about that, Philip. But uh We'll, we'll, I think that we're looking probably sometime around 7 p.m. Pacific time, 10 p.m. Eastern time. That would make Philip have to get up at 4 a.m. But we'll announce that definitively on IHC, and then we'll have about an hour session to go over all the questions and answers that people come up with. Uh, I was going to pick three questions from the Q&A that we can uh, address right now, and then we can continue this, dis this discussion on Friday night. Uh, for those of you that are watching just on Zoom, if you go on to the uh, onto Facebook, I know that most of you guys are IHC members, but if you're not, uh, just uh, on Facebook, um, just look for International Hernia Collaboration uh, and uh, join that group. Um, and so Brian, uh, Brian will be happy to host you, and we'll all we'll all meet there on Friday night. So uh, there were a few questions. Um, so while we're on while we're talking mesh philip uh you want to give you so the question from miguel garcia was is, do you think that the pro grip 10 by 15 is too small uh what is your opinion on that well uh we did a study published in surgery uh which we needed in belgium because in belgium to get a mesh reimbursed you need a study of uh, with one year follow-up and that was with the 15 by 10 mesh so uh, and if you look at the long-term results at one year of these uh, 100 patients, they were doing fine. We had no recurrences in that cohort of patients. So, uh, and, and, and also the, the, the chronic pain levels were, were amazingly low. So uh, from what we've published, you could say 10 by 15 should do well. Uh, but okay, I'm, I, 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 like, I like bigger mesh if it's possible. 
and it's usually quite uh, possible to put a mesh 16 by 12. So that's why I, I changed. But if I follow my own evidence, I should not have. Yeah, I think that from hernia surge, we see the same thing that the data supports 10 by 15. Uh, and so that, that is the min, that's the minimum size. But definitely if you have an M3 or an L3 hernia, and especially with the medial directs, it, it does make sense to go bigger, which is why the 12 by 17 size is made. Um, there was another question while we're, while we're discussing you know, your video of, robotic, of a robotic approach. Uh, Manish Chowdhury asked, uh, what is the cost efficacy of robot versus lap? And I think that every system is different, but Philip really has this down to a science. So um, can you answer that one for the audience? So we've actually, interesting question. And yeah, when you read the American papers, you fall over because the prices in the US are so different from what we have. So I, I've analyzed and we haven't published it yet, but that will come. Uh, I think it was about almost 400 robotic groin hernia cases and compared it to 280 lab cases all operate by me. The difference in material cost is 650 euros more or less. Uh, so that's the price tag with it. That's not taking into account the capital cost of the robot. So basically the instruments, the difference in instruments. So uh, look at, uh, I was always say answering 700 and the research that we did now uh, is in line with that, but six to 700 euros more uh, in a European set. Yeah, I think that you can also, uh, it also just really depends on your system and also what you use. You know, in, in my hospital, if we routinely use, you know, I don't routinely use a tacker, but some people use a tacker and a balloon. And so if you then calculate the cost of a tacker and a balloon, robotics, especially the way that Philip does it and I do the same where we try to minimize instruments, you really can be cost equivalent or actually cost less taking out capital costs. So it's just a question of what you use. Um, you remember that tackers are the most expensive of all devices. So um, there's a quick question from Renee that asks, uh, Philip, do you use any fixation in an M3 inguinal hernia in addition to pro-grip mesh? Or are you comfortable just with the micro-grips? So what I do in the uh, interesting question, I do additional fixation just by enlarging my mesh. So if I have a big M3 hernia and it's a unilateral one, if it's a bilateral one, I use one mesh. Uh, so then the overlap is to the other side. But I do add five centimeters across the midline. Uh, so this is additional fixation for the large M2. So the mesh would be 20 by 30. That's the way I do uh, my big medials. So I'm in line with the guidelines to do additional fixation, but just with a bigger mesh. Okay, great. I'm gonna do one last question and then what we're gonna do is we'll save all these questions for Friday night on IHC. Uh, I, I appreciate that everybody joined us um, you know, during the middle of the days and at all times all around the world. It's great to see each other. But, um, the last question that I'll, I'll answer here was some, somebody asked, uh, would we, do I use local anesthesia to prevent uh, post-op pain with MIS hernia surgery? And I'll only answer this because uh, I think it, Ed Felix is still on and it's kind of a, it's a interesting learning point that once again, Ed Felix taught me this, uh, but not in necessarily a good way. So we in, I, I inject the port sites, but I routinely don't inject local anesthesia into the preperitoneal pocket. And uh, some people have to describe this. And so for, uh, for Dr. Felix, for Professor Felix, at the end of his case, I, I, you know, we want to treat our friends a little differently. And so I put in some local anesthesia into his preperitoneal pocket. And uh, in the recovery room, he couldn't stand up because he was numb in the femoral nerve distribution and it dissipates in there. So the answer is don't squirt any local in the preperitoneal space. Uh, probably more relevant because he had a redo and those nerves are a little bit more exposed. Uh, but still, I, I think that there's no good benefit for it and we can just inject the port sites. So uh, I think with that, we're probably going to uh, wrap this up and see all of you guys on Friday. Philip, do you have anything else that no, you can think? Nothing to add. I say if you have questions that pop up, look again at the videos and uh, put the questions to us through Facebook. Yeah, so these videos uh, will be, this will be parked both on IHC that you can watch it and it will also be parked on web surge uh, later on. So any questions that you put up here, I'll write them down and we'll have them for Friday. And then any questions that we'll, we'll put a stream up on IHC and we'll just have questions that we can answer as we go along on Friday night.
So I want to thank uh, Philip, obviously, uh, always so nice to see you. I wish that we could have been in Ghent together. Uh, Ruth, uh, you're amazing. And, you know, she really ran the whole EHS uh, second day session. And so she really is the, the Zoom queen these days. And you go uh, on the back end on Medtronic really for helping make this uh, work. And we'll see all of you guys on Facebook on Friday night with Brian Jacob. Thanks, everybody. Okay, bye. Okay. Hugo, can you turn off the broadcast?